Coming up on Theater Talk. The Tonys, you know, are, are so full of sort of conflicts of interest, the way that they vote for these, because you have all these sort of road presenters who are voting for Best Musical, and then they want that Best Musical winner in their house, you know, across the country, and so they, they want to show that it'll pull in a lot of money. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Michael, your chief competitor in the world of journalism is here today. I have no competitors. Who are you talking about? Ah, uh, the wonderful Patrick <laughs> Healy from the New York Times, who's sitting right here oh, looking right. so wonderful. We thought we would uh, bring you up to speed on some of the uh, goings on behind the scenes on Broadway right now with our dear friend Patrick Healy of the New York Times, who who is a spirited and uh, friendly competitor of mine over at the paper. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Patrick. Thanks for having me. Um, all right, Spider-Man is the is the musical that is always in the headlines. And recently you and I were writing about it because we are in the midst of these lawsuits between Bono and the Edge and Julie Taymor. What's the latest on the legal tussle they're going Taymor and Spider-Man? Sure, they're going back and forth on these settlement talks. Nobody wants uh, to have either Bono on a stand in January 2013 talking about we showing do. up. We do. <laughs> <laughs> they don't uh, want Bono in the stand talking about showing up at meetings. Uh, Drunk with supermodels. Apparently, yeah, tipsy with supermodels. Julie doesn't want to get on the stand and have to face all of these allegations and email that she was difficult to work with, uh, that she was Ooh, sort of throwing you diva fits. No, exactly. So there's not a lot of upside for anybody to go on. So they keep going back and forth. The thing is, you know, as you've written about it, I've written about it, there's a lot of money at stake. People have stopped talking about whether the show will ever make its money back and started talking about how it could turn into this franchise that would run in arenas around the world in sort of concert versions. So there's a lot of money at stake. There's also, and you and I, I think, probably are hoping this will come out someday. The uh, documentary of the making of Spider-Man that right. one of the producer's sons, Jacob Cole, the Jacob son of Michael Cole, Cole. Michael yeah, fil he filmed it. Uh, he's during, got everything. He's got he's fights. Got he's got everything. Everything. He's but got a lot Michael of meetings. But is Michael Cole being sued big time on this? Michael Cole's being sued by Julie to give her either some kind right. of approval or to stop it. So there's just a lot of elements at play and a lot of things they don't want to come out. We should say Jacob Cole, Michael Cole's son, has been filming this thing. Mm -hmm. And he's captured all of these fights and feuds that we've written about. And Julie, in her lawsuit, is seeking to stop that movie from ever being released. Well, can you blame her? It's, you know, it's a very interesting legal issue because she's a public figure. She, I'm Did told, she sign the release? I'm told she had signed releases way back when mm. because it was going to be a promotional movie for the thing. And now that it's the producer's son, the producer yeah. who she's at war with, yeah. you know, she has no control over how she's uh, how she's portrayed. She probably has moments in which she comes across, you know, sort of the dutiful, hard-working director while Bono and Edge are off in Australia making money on U2. Uh, but then there are also probably moments where she's, you know, pu sort of pulling. I don't give out. a bleep what the audience thinks. <laughs> Those kind of moments that she's quoted in one lawsuit. This issue of the money of Spider-Man is interesting to me, though, because do you believe the show really could ever make any money in New York? The merchandising has been huge. I mean, that is selling for them uh, in a pretty hot way. Ticket sales, it's interesting. There's a huge amount of walk-up business. Now, I think probably a lot of that is discounted. So it's hard to imagine. But that said, I didn't necessarily think it would be running into possibly two or three or four years. But now it looks like it has real staying But even out. then, I mean, the capitalization is, what, 75 or $80 million. Yep. The running cost is 1.1, 1.2. Yep. So even if they're grossing $1.3 million, the profit that week is only $100,000. you got to run a long time to make back $80 million if you're only making $100,000. No, absolutely. I mean, I think the, their long-term view is to have these overseas concerts mm -hmm. where they only play, instead of running for years and years in London, they have like a five-night stand somewhere and they try to pack in 10,000 people, 20,000 people into an but arena. But how's that going to work safety-wise? Well, it's a, to that they can it's a injure people from one end of the globe <laughs> to the other. But getting back to the case, the thing I always wonder is why don't they just pay Julie Taymor the two dollars, give her the money she wants, give her the credit she wants, and forget about it? It seems so spiteful on their t whatever she did. 
you know, she was the auteur coming from the beginning. Then, you know, I know her co-writer conspired against her, it is said, to write a second script. Oh, Berger, right. Glenn Berger, the but, whole Judas of the whole thing, but, but, who Julie plucked out of obscurity and practically poverty to be her co-writer. <laughs> and then he turned on her and was secretly rewriting the script behind her back. There's a lot of secrecy and conspiracy going on. The anger, Susan, is yes, unlike anything it. I've seen in my three years in the job. They're, Michael, and their anger against her. Point. Their anger against her, they are furious at her. They're furious that she unloaded all of these email uh, against Bono, an email that she knew was going to get under his skin, but mostly that she is still parading around as they see it, saying, I'm the director of this big success story. They didn't do much work in this overhaul, and that she's still sort of sticking in their side. Now, from her point of view, she was the one who was, you know, originally thwarted by this coup plotting behind her back, these people who were allegedly her friends. I mean, you know the way, you know, these egos work. Bono and Edge and, and Julie thought they were, you know, friends the brilliant, and the brilliant artists, you know, who were so much above what everyone else was, uh, was doing on Broadway. They were doing something new and brilliant. And, you know, the idea that they would sort of stab her in the back, which she absolutely feels, well, uh, is, you know, still sticking in her. Going back before uh, she was, you know, whacked, when they started promoting this thing, and you had photos of her and Bono and the Edge, sure. showing them working together, and then all of a sudden he's saying, oh, well, I wasn't there. And, you know, for anyone who'd been following the publicity, you looked and said, well... Uh, well, one thing... presenting it the, that the, way. The one thing I always found extraordinary was Bono and the Edge have tried to pretend that the fiasco, Julie's version, the fiasco version, they had nothing to do with right, it. Right, right. Well, well, we weren't really around. They wrote the, f uh, I'm sorry, they wrote. The bleeping. They, they wrote uh, the show with her for nine years they worked on it. Right. You're and trying to tell were... me they had no idea that she created this character called Arachne? No, and, and then and they and went away and let, let her him do talk. it. Yeah. Sure, and all last fall, and all, and all during the fall of 2010, uh, they were having, uh, you know, interviews with the media over dinner in which they were, you know, stroking each other's ego so much and talking about each other's brilliance. And Bono and Edge said several times to me that they had read the script, they were enthusiastic, they thought Julie and Glenn had come up with this great story. Uh, this was something that was going to reinvent all of Broadway. And they were all in on this. So the idea that somehow they didn't have anything to do, what they didn't have anything to, to do with was they were away during that December when... Everything, all hell was breaking know, loose. Yeah, Chris Tierney just... fell 30 feet when the woman who's playing Arachne got whacked in the head by the right. rope. And Julie has these emails in which she's saying, come back, help I need me. your help. Yeah. And, you know, they were down in Australia making money. Making YouTube. billions in, on, on YouTube. So uh, they would rather you're... spite her than and, and have a court case than just pay her. No, no, I... no. You suspect a settlement, don't I you? S I suspect yeah. a settlement from everything that I've heard. I mean, I think it would be... Pretty unusual, just uh, you know the way these lawsuits go for them all to be on the stand. Yeah, yeah, I can't see that. No, I think they they've had to sort of thump their chest and hit each other. She hit them, they hit her. She's come back and hit them. They might run her down again one more time, and then I think they'll they'll probably settle. Right. I mean, the thing that'll be interesting is just how deep does the anger go? I mean, for Jerry Harris and Michael Cole, the producers, to come up with a settlement that looks somehow good uh, and warm feeling for Julie is going to take a lot for them, and I don't think they're there yet temperamentally. So, Well, Michael Cole, who's a you know big guy in the rock business, lawsuits are uh, part of the game. Of sure. He's been involved in all sorts of lawsuits yeah, all the sure. time. You know, it's yeah. just a club that you use. It's, 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 it's part of your business. Yep, absolutely. So, um, just a couple other things I want to touch on. Surprisingly, Patrick, we have this show from Disney called Newsies, that seems to be doing doing quite well on Broadway and sort of coming from nowhere and could be a contender for the for the Tony Award. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be probably a Newsies one uh, Newsies face off with once for the best Tony. And musical. once is this little show based once on is, the independent. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's sort of it reminds me a little bit of my first year in the beat when you had Billy Elliot sort of the big show and next to normal, you know, this little show that came from off Broadway. Um, that was full of feeling and intimate, whereas Billy Elliot, you had sort of the big singing, the big dancing, and also the show that could tour, which right. a lot of the Tony voters, you know, want. They, you know, the, the Tonys, you know, are, are so full of sort of conflicts of interest, the way that they vote for these, because you have all these sort of road presenters who are voting for Best Musical, and then they want that Best Musical winner in their house, you know, across the country, and so they, they want a show that'll pull in a lot of money. I think um, Disney 
which had been battered a bit here because people didn't like Little Mermaid and they didn't like um, Tarzan, Tarzan, which was terrible. Absolutely. And I don't, even though Mary Poppins is a hit, I don't think it was really embraced by the, the theater world. Uh, but people seem to genuinely like Newsies. And Disney is very good because they've been through these Tony campaigns before at going through these campaigns and they have all this money to buy many tables at your benefits Absolutely. and show up at all this kind of stuff and just remind people of how powerful and helpful they can be. The voters come to town. They love to be wined That's and right. dined. They love to have, you know, their their egos and their reputation stroked. I mean, Disney is uh, is first among. You could you could just see these voters coming to town and and um, um, Tom Schumacher at Disney throwing a big, big lavish lunch for them at the Four Seasons with all the newsboys coming in to serve them. The poor ones, people like, well, here here's our CD. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Newsies has that sort of young, energetic, attractive And I'm cast. not going to Tom Schumacher's lunch, and Newsies is just so fun. I mean, Newsies has gotten the best reviews, I think, of any Disney show since The Lion King. Well, it it's is gonna the be, best of yeah, the it's Disney gonna be, It's going to be very hard yeah. to beat. The thing about Once, I suppose, is that it's a, it's a great date show. It's lovely. I think it's very, yeah. you know, it sort of has a, a romantic, you know, sort of full heart feeling. Is there a stealth candidate here in Nice Work If You Can Get It, the Matthew Broderick old Gershwin show that they're hauling out there? I think that's I think that's the one to keep the eye on. The Gershwins are having a pretty incredible year of sort of repurposing right, right. their classic shows to get with out Porgy there and Best money with, there. you know, with Porgy and Best. Um, when Audra shows up, by the way. We'll Audra see. McDonald missed 10, 10 performances, which really threw <laughs> oh, them for wow. a loop. But we'll, see, yeah. we'll, see, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's, you know, Leap of Faith is coming in. There are sort of these other shows, but it Ghost. seems like it's going to be Ghost. Yeah. You know, I, but I think, I think, I mean, nice work if you can get us the one to keep an eye on. Yeah, but I, I suspect it's going to be a Newsies once race. That's just my just my feeling. Um, any good plays out there you'd like to you call viewers' attention to? If uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited season? about seeing The Lions uh, up in the Court Theater. It's Nikki coming from Off Broadway. Nikki Lavin. Silver's play with Linda Lavin. Uh, End of the Rainbow has this performance that is pretty magnetic in I terms saw it, of yeah. um, in terms of Tracy Bennett playing Judy Garland yeah. that race after a couple years where it was really the the men categories that were doing well in acting I mean this year for best actress in a play you probably have Tracy Bennett friend of the rainbow Definitely. Stockard Channing Linda uh, Lavin other desert cities Linda Lavin maybe Nina Arianda from or Venus and Fur, Fur. Maybe Cynthia Nixon for Wit. I mean, and Rosemary Harris. And Rosemary Harris from Road to Mecca. I mean, you've got a. I mean, those are six that uh, you know will be will be pretty tough. And then One Man Two Governors. Very funny play. Very very funny, and it's interesting. All these new plays opening, something like ten new plays between late March and late April. There aren't actually a lot of you know pure comedies and. One Man, Two Governors would fit that. It's going to make a big start of James Corden, the kid who plays is the lead there. I know that the producers of One Man, Two Governors, Nick Heitner from the National Theater who directed it, they want it to be considered a revival, hmm. in which case then it will go head to head with Death of a Salesman, Death of a Mike Salesman. Nichols' production of Death of a Salesman. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the Tony Committee rules on that. Uh, it, because one man, two, one man, Two Governors is based on the old Goldoni play, The I Master know, of Servants, and they want, they're going to petition to be a revival. I yeah, did a yeah. story in the National Theater last summer and reread uh, Servant of Two Masters mm -hmm. before seeing One Man, Two Governors. It, they're very, very different plays, so it'll be, that'll be an interesting one. I don't Scott, think Rudin, would... Scott Rudin would like One Man, Two Governors <laughs> to be considered a new play, so he's got a clear yeah, shot. Exactly. Well, that best play category will be, will be tricky. I mean, Other Desert Cities has been That doing, seems to be the favorite. It's, well, the favorite, but, you know, our favorite show, Clyburn Park, is coming in. Um, you know, now to Broadway, it won the Pulitzer last year for best drama. Um, it's got, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of meat on that in terms of both comedy and... Um, I think One Man, Two Governors, no matter which way the committee rules, can upend the race. I mean, if it goes to revival, then I think Death of a Salesman has a real struggle on its hands to beat One Man, Two Governors. I think oh. if One Man, Two Governors becomes best play, a new play, I think it's a real race between that and other other desert cities. It's interesting because, I mean, other desert cities and Clyburn Park are both, are both um, getting produced regionally around the country. So in terms of the road, I'm not sure if they'll say a One Man, Two Governors is a show that we can bring everywhere the same way that they did with War Horse, which won Best Play last year, which was also from the National Theater. My sense is that One Man, Two Governors, is, it's, it's so much fun. And it comes in at a, the right time, just before the Tonys. You know, 
Clyburn Park, I think, is a little too small, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. I think other desert cities has been around a little too long. Mm. And so if One Man, Two Governors is a new play, it comes in, and the Tony voters just have that absolutely delightful, delirious time at it, mm -hmm. right before they're going to mark their ballots, mm. I think it might carry it. I mean, it's interesting. One Man, Two Governors had a brilliant first act. That first act was hysterical. And I do remember sitting in, in Act Two thinking, how are they going to top Act One, whereas the second act in other desert cities especially has so much payoff. I mean, you do leave, I, at least I did, you know, really uh, sent for a loop. Whereas with One Man, Two Governors, I remember coming away thinking, well, that was really funny, but it was really the first act that was terrific. Well, this is what a horse race is, and we'll be uh, stirring the pot. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Patrick <laughs> Healy from the New York Times, thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Here it comes! <laughs> Unveil it, boys! Oh, it's champagne! <laughs> oh, gee, take a few in the sport. One of Off-Broadway's great pioneers, Ted Mann, died in February. Ted was the founder of the Circle in the Square down on Bleecker Street, where they did some um, uh, very important revivals of O'Neill plays with Jason Robards. And the theater eventually moved uptown to uh, 50th Street on Broadway, where it still is today. Uh, Ted was here uh, talking about his life in the theater, and we want to show you a little uh, clip of our interview with him tonight. Ted Mann has written a book about creating that theater, Journeys in the Night, Creating a New American Theater with Circle in the Square. And we're very happy that Ted Mann is joining us on Theater Talk Thank tonight. You. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Pleasure. Welcome. Um, all right. Y you can't really um, overstate your importance in the American theater because you, along with the great director Jose Quintero, brought Eugene O'Neill, the great American playwright, back to the forefront. What was the first O'Neill play you did at Circle in the Square? And the how Ice did you, Man Cometh. And how did you come, why did you decide to do that play? For years I've been trying to get the rights to an O'Neill play. And every year I would call the agent, would say no. You know, and I said, well, can't we do one of the, you know, one of the lesser known? No. And uh, this year, 1956, uh, I called and she said, uh, well, I'm going to ask Mrs. O'Neill. Carlotta. If, Carlotta, yeah. And uh, at that, uh, he, I had read his plays when I was younger, and I always felt, you know, I had a kinship with it. And uh, at, also at that time, we were broke, dead broke. The theater, yeah. And uh, the Ice Man Cometh has a cast of 25, <laughs> four and a half hours long. <laughs> and I thought, if we're going to go down, let's go down big. <laughs> you know? I like that way of thinking. <laughs> And uh, so uh, she said, Mrs. O'Neill would like to meet you and Jose. And we had read The Iceman and loved it. And as you know, in 1946, it had been done right after World War II. And it was, uh, it was considered a lesser play. You know, the, the reviews, if you look at them, were kind of like kind. And the failure of it really broke O'Neill's heart, did it not? Oh, yes, because, uh, I mean, he... I guess he felt that that was one of his great plays. It was also one of his sort of breakaway from his tradition of the style of play that he was writing. But so you, you got to meet Eugene O'Neill's widow, Carlotta, to convince yeah. her to let you have the rights to Iceman Cometh. How did you do that? Um, well, we went and uh, we, we researched what plays. She had said through the agent, well, which of his plays would you like to do? And I said, well, we'd like to do the Iceman, which we had just discovered. And so when we came in to see uh, Mrs. O'Neill, she was delighted and immediately gave us the rights to do it, mm. not having seen anything of what we were doing at all. Mm -hmm. And this is the but play. But she's also relayed what you just said, that, you know, that it had broken his heart. And so to any resurrection, even though she didn't know who was going to resurrect it, would be, it would be a worthy gamble because it had failed so badly in the first production. Yeah, and of course that was a launched Jason Robards' career and really established you as the leading, as the off-Broadway theater movement because it was Brooks Atkinson who saw that production and gave you the monumentally great review in the New York Times. Well, but I mean, our, our connection really, our connection as a, a major force, let's say, or the birth of off-Broadway happened with Summer and Smart. Right, yeah. Geraldine Page. Yeah, yeah. really yeah. 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 famous production. And that also had been a play that had failed on Broadway. We hadn't seen it, and we were looking for a play for Jerry Page, mm -hmm. who Jose knew from the Goodman School. Right. And, uh, and, and Jose came one day after looking through lots of scripts and said, I found it. 
and what did you find? Summer and Smoke. We read it, uh, the rest of the people on the board, and we liked it too. And uh, Jerry was called in, and I, I said, you know, Jerry, we want you to play Alma. Oh, she said, oh, bless you, now they can hear me. Ah. Now they'll hear me, meaning the public, the critics, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was your theater open to the extent that, uh, you know, a, an actor, a total unknown actor just struggling out there could show up on the doorstep and ask for an audition, try to get in? Were you that open to everybody coming in? Well, there was a, a show, show business paper, and they would always, we'd put something in there about casting, and the people would come. <clears throat> they didn't have to come through an agent, whoever called. You know, we set up an appointment for him. What do you think of been, uh, being a leader in the um, off-Broadway, non-profit, institutional theater <laughs> movement, creator of it in many ways, what do you think about our big non-profit theaters today? Do you were do, I think of the Roundabout, Manhattan Theater Club, you were doing O'Neill, you were doing Williams, you were doing plays that had failed, you mm -hmm. were taking incredible risks doing this. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, our non-profits are doing old musicals, sort of sitcom type plays, and it's all about stars. Does that disappoint well, some you? some I wouldn't say all. I mean, some are doing But a lot it. of the big ones are. Yeah, Where is that sense of adventure that you and Jose had when you well, were in the theater? It's the whole thing's totally different. You know, it's like, uh, go to dinner at somebody's house, they have served that kind of dinner. Go to somebody else's house, it's a very, you know, a lot of people helping and so forth. In, in our case, we didn't have anybody to help. <laughs> the nonprofit giving didn't really exist. Yeah. So we were doing whatever we could do with whatever money we had. So, and productions at that time cost anywhere. We could do one for probably $2,000. Yeah. Today, the same thing would probably cost close to a million, million and a half or more. So you've been poor in the theater and you've been well off in the theater. Did the poor face stimulate you in in a way that that I love challenge. Yes. So so do you mm -hmm. think you would have lost? You, do you think it, that the circle in the square would have been less if you'd been uh, amply endowed f from earlier on? If you'd had I more so, capital? Yeah. I think so. I think you. I think it's good to have your back up against the wall. Mm. And I find for myself when my back is up against the wall, everything else clears away, and I see that's what we need to do. Mm. You know, it's like an instant light comes on. So necessity breeds invention I in think the theater, so. yeah. 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 I think that's true in the art world, it makes for better painters mm -hmm. and musicians, composers, you know. Mm. You know, I, I <laughs> wanted to ask you one more thing. Before you got it, as you were starting Circle in the Square, you really had been trained in performance space management by working for your father in a jazz club. Isn't that true? Yeah, well my father was involved in jazz clubs on 52nd Street in the early 52nd Street in the time when it was really the jazz clubs. And uh, the, uh, he was involved with three different clubs there. And then it was later when it was with uh, Birdland and Basin Street East. You know, I was watching the interrelationship between the performers and the management. And I learned a lot uh, from that. What's the best thing you learned about how the management should treat the performers? Uh, be friendly, mm. be human, mm. be human and help help when you can. Many, you know, many times people need a little extra money, you know, they got in a debt or something like that, you know. So you would pass out a little cash from time to time to the actors who were yeah, a little pinched? Yeah, sure, yeah. So that certainly shows dealing with musicians in the jazz world who's with their erratic lives and always a need for money, you brought that empathy into the, to the theater world yeah, and, and it also, served you well. Also, I, I, I like actors, so it became part of my social life, my wife and myself. My wife was an opera singer. Yes, very so well I, known. I was living, I was living that uh, side of the world, not being an actor or a performer myself, and uh, it just is, is a place I like to be. You know the. Uh, I mean, with the, artists. The, I think there's a sad strain, though, to all of this in the book. That is it. I wonder if it's true that now that the city is so rich and you have to be rich to live in Greenwich Village. Can you have that kind of lively art scene with young people who have no money who are sleeping on couches and turning great performances? Yeah. Or is that over if you're in a city now that's only for the elite and the rich? I don't think so. I think just as hard as it was for us to find a place, when we found the place on Sheridan Square, it had been a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my father had recommended we go there to look at it. My father had these clubs, involved in these clubs, 52nd Street, Birdland, and, uh, and I, 
once had to pay back some money that I we borrowed to do a show with some, let's say, dark figures, <laughs> uh, you know, slanted <laughs> okay. hats and cigarettes and so okay. forth. <laughs> and I was to walk up. Uh, he was leaning against uh, the building that was Jack Dempsey's restaurant, and I was told he's going to wear a hat. He's holding a newspaper. He's smoking a cigarette. Just put the two hundred dollars in. Don't ask him anything and walk away. <laughs> well, it turns out that that whole area that I was living in, my father was wor working in, was where we are now. It's like I never went away. Yeah. <laughs> the 50, 52nd, 53rd Street. Where the circle of square is today. Yeah. Well, the book is full of uh, th these great stories of the great actors and very evocative of, uh, of that period in, in New York artistic life. Uh, Journey in the Night, creating a new American theater, Circle in the Square, a memoir by Ted Mann, and we're delighted that he's been our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.